Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. This is the modern vet, Dr. Armstrong, and you are now watching the third part to my fluid therapy series. All right, I finally am putting it out. I have just completed a 12 hour shift. I am tired, but we're gonna do this and I hope it's going to be helpful and I hope I'm gonna be coherent and I hope you all understand what I'm saying because my mind is fried, but follow along with me and if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to reach out, all right? Let's get started. So in the video before this one, I was talking about dehydration, how to correct it, things of that nature. So now with hypovolemia, hypovolemia is just not giving. We're going to kind of start a little bit from the beginning, like the basics, and then work our way into how to treat it, all right? So first of all, what exactly is hypovolemic shock? We use that term a lot, we throw it around a lot. Do we even know what it means, like what it truly means? So first of all, shock, okay, is basically the body's inability to produce cellular energy so that it can function, so that it can maintain homeostasis. Basically, that's what it means, all right? So whenever you're in a state of shock, it's like your body's kind of like paralyzed, shut down, right? Now, why? You have different reasons. We have circulatory reasons, hypoxic reasons, cardiogenic reasons, and metabolic reasons. So hypovolemic shock falls under the circulatory shock category, okay? Hypovolemia in and of itself basically means a depletion of blood volume from the intravascular space. And remember, the intravascular space is in the realm of the extravascular space because we're talking about fluid outside of the cells, right? Space outside of the cells. And in particular, we're talking about the blood vessels. So low blood volume, low intravascular fluid, and as a result, you have hypovolemia. So whenever you are in a state of hypovolemic shock, that means that your body is not perfusing well, the organs are not getting the blood, the nutrients, the oxygen it needs to perform the necessary functions to keep you alive. And as a result, you're in a state of hypovolemic shock and you need help fast or you're going to die. So what exactly is the difference between severe dehydration and hypovolemic shock, like, a, like where do we draw the line? Because remember I was talking about before my other video that we have, you know, 5%, 6 to 8% dehydration, 8 to 10% dehydration, 10 to 12, you know, so when do we call a patient hypovolemic as opposed to severely dehydrated? So remember some signs that we look out for whenever we're determining a patient's hydration status. We are looking out for their skin turgor, is there still a lot of elasticity whenever you pull, you know, the back of the neck or not? Or does it tent? We're looking at their eyes. Are, this, are the orbits sunken in? We're looking at their mucous membranes. Is it tacky? Is it dry? Is it moist? And remember, if it's moist, sometimes it can be from them hypersalivating in the face of nausea. So be careful with that. But still, for the most part, are their gums dry? Is the skin tenting? Are the eyes kind of sunken in, right? Those are some things, and of course, the clinical history. Now, if it's more severe dehydration, where we're kind of like, is it dehydration or are we hypovolemic, right? Again, you're going to pay attention to the history and you're going to look at the patient's clinical signs. So not only are the gums dry, maybe the gums are dry and a little pale pink or even paleish, right? What about our capillary refill time, the CRT? Is it still less than two or are we kind of sluggish? Is it kind of like two seconds or even greater? What about our pulses? Are they bounding? In some cases, are they a little bit fair? What about their mentation? Are they BAR, bright and alert, or are they a little dull? What about their heart rate? Is it kind of normal or is it more elevated? Are they tachycardic? And in this case, I'm talking about dogs because cats and hypovolemia, it's a little bit different story. They tend to be bradycardic, but in dogs, they're tachycardic. So let's just say we're dealing with, I don't know, a golden retriever that comes in and is showing all these signs that I just mentioned and you're listening to the heart rate and it's 180. What if you check their temperature and it's a little bit on the low side and you touch their extremities like their paws and it's kind of cool to the touch? What about their blood pressure? It's hypotensive. 
what exactly is going on? Sounds like this patient is in hypovolemic shock. They've met the criteria for not just severe dehydration, but hypovolemic shock as well. Now, what if we have a patient who does not have a prolonged skin turgor? So let's just say they, there is no skin tint. Let's just say they're, the orbits, you know, they're not sunken in. Let's just say their mucous membranes are moist, right? However, their mucous membranes are pale pink, their capillary refill time is delayed or prolonged, I should say, their blood pressure is low, their heart rate is high, their pulses are bounding, things like that, all the criteria for hypovolemic shock, that means that they are hypovolemic, not necessarily dehydrated. So what is the difference between the two? Remember, dehydration basically means that the interstitial space is dry. Hypovolemia, however, is whenever the blood volume in your intravascular space is low, is depleted for one reason or another. How do we treat it? So it is definitely not going to be subcutaneous fluids, all right? Why? We know it's not, but why isn't subcutaneous fluid therapy in the face of hypovolemia appropriate? Well, it's not appropriate because number one, there's hardly any perfusion in the face of hypovolemia, okay? So it's just not gonna work. If you have no perfusion, where are the fluids, how are the fluids gonna be adequately carried into the spaces where they belong? It's just not gonna happen. Furthermore, second reason is that it takes forever for fluids to be absorbed subcutaneously. So what, on average six to eight hours? Your patient is dying now, so they don't have six to eight hours to wait. So IV fluids really is the way to go, the only way to go to fix a patient's state of hypovolemia. Now let's talk bolus, let's talk dose. What is the difference between those two words and how much are we giving, how much are we able to give to resuscitate our patient? So the magic formula for dogs is 90, on average, 90 mils per kg. That's the average rate that you'll see in literature and what we've been taught in school as well. For cats, kind of around like 60 mils per kg, all right? So let's just take a 10 kg dog who's clearly in a state of hypovolemia and we're getting ready to figure out how much we're going to need as a dose to help resuscitate him. So we're gonna take the 90 mils per kg formula and then we're going to multiply it by 10 kgs. So that's going to leave us with 900 mils. This means that in order to resuscitate our patient now and give it the fluids that it needs to help increase the blood volume status, we need to give 900 milliliters of fluid. Now, are we going to give all of it like now, 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 meaning all 900 mils right this minute? The answer is no. Why? Because number one, we don't even know what is going on with the liver and kidneys. Can, especially the kidneys, can they handle this kind of blood volume all at once? Can they handle this volume of fluid all at once? We have no idea what the patient's systemic status is. Well, really the organ system status because we haven't even gotten a chance to do blood work for the most part, right? So that's one reason why we're not just gonna blast their body with 900 mils of fluids all at once. The second reason why we're not going to blast them with fluids all at once, you know, with a full shock dose, because remember, some variants of shock look the same. So for example, you see a patient, you assume, hey, this must be hypovolemic shock. I see all the signs. But what if it's cardiogenic shock? Sometimes different uh, shock processes can look the same. So cardiogenic shock sometimes looks like hypovolemic shock. And you remember with cardiogenic shock, your heart's not working properly. So if you go and blast them with all these fluids, you're just further pushing the heart into congestive heart failure. Boom, cardiac arrest, you've just killed your patient. So that's a second reason why we don't just blast them all with fluids, all right, at all at once. However, we need to give them fluids now. So what do we do? How do we calculate how much is appropriate to give at a time? When I was in school, I was taught a quarter of the dose should be your shock bolus, okay? Meaning I'm gonna take that 900 milliliters and I'm gonna divide it by four, and then that is how much I give at a time, all right? On the floor, out in practice, I've been taught a third, okay? Even in you know the um, CE now, everyone's saying, you know, you can do a third, you can do a fourth, no real right or wrong answer. 
Um, for the sake of this video and for the ease of math, I'm going to go ahead and do a third. So a third of 900 mils is 300 milliliters. So that means that right now, after I've placed my catheter, I'm going to go ahead and give my patient a bolus of 300 milliliters now. Now, I've given my patient 300 milliliters, what do I do next? The next step is to reassess. You give your fluids, you reassess, okay? So you give the fluids over the course of say 10 to 15 minutes, you stop, you reassess your patient. So what are you checking for? Well, all the criteria that you found to determine them to be hypovolemic are the criteria that you're going to, you know, the parameters that you're going to use to measure where they are now. So how well they are responding to your initial fluid therapy. So you're going to check out their pulses. You're going to see if they're still bounding. You're going to check out their capillary refill time and see, is it still greater than two? You're going to check out their mucus, the color of their mucous membranes. Is it still pale pink? Is it still pale? Or are we starting to get a bit more color? You're going to, you know, check their extremities? Are they still feeling cool? You're going to look at their mentation. Are they still dull? You're going to listen to their heart. Is it still tachycardic? Things like that. Once you start seeing changes in the parameters, once things start to normalize, right, then you look at your patient and you determine, do I give another bolus or not, right? Do I, do I stop or do I keep going? Let's just say the patient that we're dealing with, not much has changed. So we go ahead and we do another bolus of 300 milliliters over the course of 10 to 15 minutes. We stop, we reassess. Now the heart rate is starting to normalize. Now it's from, you know, say 180, now it's down to 120. Now the pulses aren't bounding as much. Now I'm starting to see more color in the gums. The, the capillary refill time or CRT is now less than two seconds. The mentation, this dog is now perking up. He's more bright, he's sitting up sternal. He's, you know, wagging his tail a little bit. Do I continue with a third bolus? I don't have to. In fact, I can just go ahead and tailor his fluid therapy plan to where he's at now. Obviously, at this point, I should have gotten my point of care blood work results back so I know what's going on with electrolytes and things like that, and so on and so forth, all right? He's clearly not out of the world works yet, but at the same time, he's no longer in a critical state. Now, let's just say we have a patient. Let's just say the same patient we've done one fluid bolus, nothing would change. We did a second fluid bolus, nothing changed. And now we're onto our third of the full dose. Okay, so now we've just completed giving a third bolus, which means a total of 900 mils, basically over the course of what, 45 minutes? And there's not much improvement. What do we do? Well, honestly, at this point, I would probably have already considered using a colloid. Remember our colloids increase the oncotic pressure within the intravascular space. So if I put in another catheter, so I have two in my cephalic veins, then you know one is going with the um, crystalloids and then the other one's going with the colloids. And the colloids will serve as like um, sticky tape or you know some kind of tape, some kind of adhesive for the crystalloids that are coursing through the intravascular space. So that way things can be kept within, right? Um, especially if the patient is hypoalbuminemic for some reason, right? Low albumin levels, low proteins. And so therefore, no matter how much crystalloids you push into the veins, the body's not able to retain. It just kind of disperses through because there's poor oncotic pressure because there's like little albumin. So adding the colloid will help keep everything in. And that way you can just have greater success as far as resuscitating your patient. But remember what the colloid does is not only is it going to keep the crystalloids in the intravascular space, but it's also gonna kind of draw some fluid out of the interstitium into the intravascular space. So you kind of run the risk of dehydrating your patient that really wasn't even dehydrated to begin with, right? So when you're doing the crystalloids though, those crystalloids will then disperse out. So it's kind of like balancing, right? So if I'm, if, if I'm a colloid, if I'm taking away from the interstitium to help pull into the intravascular space, all at the same time holding on to the fluids that are in the intravascular space. And remember, I'm kind of drying out my interstitium. The crystalloids then that are in the intravascular space are going to be like, it's okay, I got you. And they're going to move out into the interstitium and kind of help balance out to make sure that your patient is not becoming dehydrated. All right. So once again, once you have resuscitated your patient, you should make sure that all the criteria that we reviewed earlier that were an indication for hypovolemic shock have been resolved. 
to the best of your ability and you continue your patient on the appropriate fluids, on the appropriate fluid rate, you know, depending on whatever is going on. It could be twice maintenance, maybe maintenance and a half, right? Whatever. Maybe you need to add some blood products because the patient is actually hemorrhaging um, or experience significant blood loss, which is why they're in a state of hypovolemia to begin with. But whatever you do, always reassess your patient in between, always check the electrolytes over the course of you know a couple hours depending on how long they're gonna be hospitalized just always 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 and don't just look at numbers use your hands use your eyes use your ears with the stethoscope always 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 stay on top of your patient's clinical status i hope this was very helpful and if you have any questions at all please do not hesitate to let me know and i'll do my best to answer them to the best of my ability all right i will see you guys in the next video thanks for watching